Well, good evening tonight. Uh, we just finished up our Wednesday night Bible study, and we looked at uh, a couple verses out of uh, chapter 14, and we're going to redo those here because the video didn't record, so I'm, I'm going to go back and talk about those now. And, uh, if you got your Bibles with you and you want to pick, uh, pick up those verses, it's uh, verses 6 and 7 out of chapter 14. Remember last time we uh, were together, uh, last Wednesday, if you're here or if you listen on line there, uh, we looked at 144,000 souls that had been saved. Those are ones that devoted themselves to God. They they were serving Him. They were preaching the gospel during this tribulation period. And now they're with the Lamb. They're, they're in heaven, in glory. And they're singing this new song. They've got this song in their heart. And, and as we talked about this last, past week, we, we too have a, a song in our heart. I, I've had this little tune on my head for the last few days. I can't really put the words to it, but I, I, I know kind of the melody. I've been humming it. Uh, last few days and uh, just kind of gives you a little pep in your step and, and you're singing praises to, to, to God and it's kind of there in your heart. But today we're going to look at another group of individuals here in a minute, but uh, verses six and seven say this. And then I saw another angel flying overhead with an eternal gospel to announce the inhabitants of the earth to every nation and tribe and language of people. He spoke with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship the one who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the springs and the waters. Uh, one of the greatest things that I get to do as a pastor is to compel lost people uh, to trust in Jesus Christ. Uh, it's such a blessing that I have to share the good news of the gospel. As, as uh, the gospel says, Jesus came to save sinners. And I, I get to be part of that. I get to share in that. God does all the work in that. If you're here uh, tonight, we, we talked a little bit about God convicting. So God has to do that. God is the one that, that directs the heart to change in us and, and come to him. But but we get to be part as believers, as you, if you're a believer, and, and others that are believers, we, not only pastors, but we get to share in telling others this good news about Jesus Christ. And that's a privilege that we have to tell people of this great and awesome God that has came from heaven down here to earth. He lived a sinless life. He, he suffered all the things that we go through. And then he suffered even more in going to a cross and taking our punishment, the, the th stuff that we deserve, he put it all on the cross on himself, and he died. And three days later, being God that he was, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and now he sits in heaven, mediating for those of us who are his. And we learned, beloved, that this book of Revelation is a book of blessing. It is meant to encourage us as the church to, to let us know all of these things that has been laid out throughout history. God has got a plan God is preparing a time when he's going to come again. He wants us to know that, that it's all going to be okay. He's got it in control. He's going to judge evil for what it is. And he wants everybody to follow him. And in the end of this, we see that it then ushers in the eternal reign of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We've noticed that this is not just a book of wrath. Some believers might think, but this is a message for anybody who's going to hold out, that, that Jesus died for you too. Time and again, we've seen positive images all throughout the book of Revelation of God's love, of God's grace being poured out. And time and again, we've seen men refuse to trust in him. And all of this is kind of set in the backdrop of chapter 12 and 13, where we see the Satan and the beast and, and all of these evil world powers being squeezed together and throughout that scattered God's grace, God's love. He had two witnesses at the Wailing Wall. He's got 144,000 that are speaking the truth. He sent plague after plague to let them know that he, in fact, is in charge and they are living in disobedience. And as we see in this passage here in chapter 14, God sends out one final call, one last call for anybody who hasn't heard or doesn't know to come to him. And you remember, church, this proclamation has been made by the mighty angel back in chapter 10 that Jesus is on his way. The king is coming. And I personally don't think there's too much time between that proclamation in chapter 10 and what we're going to see unfold as these seven trumpets begin to come on the scene. I think it's only a matter of days or weeks or maybe in a few months. Remember, John's just giving 
us pieces of the puzzle. He doesn't have the whole thing, as we don't have the whole thing here. We just got a little bit. There's going to be a treaty with Israel between Antichrist. There's going to be a rapture of the church at some point in time. I believe it's before. And then all of these things are kind of going to wrap up with us. So you, you know just as well as I do that seven years goes by really quick. And the warning here is to turn to God before it's too late. You guys may remember, if you've studied scripture at all, uh, in Luke chapter 2, where the angels make the announcement that unto you in the city of David, a child is born. He is Christ the Lord, the Savior. And then the whole heavenly chorus breaks out and sings praises to God. Well, here in this passage, we have an angel that gets to make a proclamation. He is flying to and fro, and he is saying, fear God. Trust in the one who's created everything. You see, Satan, he failed to get the child. We saw that in chapter 13. He failed to get after the Jews as he's been trying to do over and over throughout history. So he's turned his attention to the people of God. He's turned his attention to destroying anything about God because he hates God. But God wants to save us. God wants us to come to him. And that's why he went to the cross. And so this judgment now comes is just before the angel comes and he makes this proclamation that men should fear God and give God glory because the hour of his judgment has come. But again, this is one last call, one very last chance that we have to turn to Jesus Christ. Just like every sermon, every invitation that's ever given, every invite to call upon the name of Jesus and trust in him because we don't know when our time is up, we don't know the last moment that we're going to take our last breath. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. You're not guaranteed another minute. We just need to come to Jesus. We need to turn to him, the one who created the heavens and the earth and the sea and the springs. and he, he, The one who gives life and the one who gives eternal life. Don't look to the world. Don't, don't trust in other things around you. But fear God, as verse 7 says. Where there is phobia. And it rightly means to have a proper reverence for the Almighty. To be in all of God. Nothing else fear God's judgment. If that's the only thing that can get you into heaven, then be afraid of that. Don't fear Satan. Don't fear the Antichrist. Be afraid of the one who can judge both the body and the soul. Because God's the one who created all things. God is the great judge. He is the ultimate judge. We think back to Genesis chapter 1 where God created everything. We find there that God is over all created order. God will judge all created order based on if they've accepted Jesus Christ. And rather than see an individual go to hell, God wants them to come to saving knowledge. And, and what we see in this passage is God still has his arms open. Let's move on down and see what happens as God proclaims this one last message. Go to chapter 15 if you don't mind. It says, then I saw another great and awe-inspiring sign. John sees something magnificent in heaven. Seven angels with seven last plagues, for with them God's wrath will be complete. I also saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who had won the victory over the beast in its image, and the number of its name, were standing on the sea of glass with harps from God. They sang the song of God's servant Moses in the song of the Lamb. Great and awe-inspiring are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Lord, who will not fear and glorify your name, for you alone are holy. And all the nations will come and worship before you, because your righteous acts have been revealed. Brother, what happens is that the angel proclaims one last message. And I think what we see in this passage is all these people begin to come to Jesus. People who have not received the mark of the beast, they start and they turn to God. They want to trust in Him. They want to follow after Him. And we had our prayer time tonight, uh, as we met a while ago, as we prayed for the sick, and we prayed for some folks that have lost loved ones. And I mentioned several of the things that we've been praying for here as a church, but and all of that, beloved, uh, it's it's good to do that. It's good to pray for folks who are sick. But one of the most important things we can do is pray for the lost. You see, the, those that are sick, 
And those that are sick and get well, they're still going to die. Well, if you're sick and you get well and you know Jesus, it's all okay. But if you're sick with sin and you don't know Jesus, then your eternal your eternity is in a place that's far worse than any sickness you're going to face in this world. So as a church, as God has a heart for those people that are lost. Our heart ought to be for the folks that don't know Jesus and are lost. We ought to be fishing for men. We ought to be so winning. That's, that's where God's focus is, beloved, as we've seen all throughout this passage, to bring people to Christ. That, that's eternal. That's what's going to last forever. If we get an illness someday, we're, we're still going to die. But if we get spiritually reborn in Jesus Christ, you have that forever. It's going to last for an eternity. And what we see here in this part, particular passage is these are people who have overcome the beast in his image. The number of his name is his of people from every tribe and tongue and language and nation. They've resisted the mark. They've resisted to follow after the beast and his prophet. And they've missed this last wrath. Talk about coming to heaven with smoke on your clothes. We notice back in verse 7 of chapter 14 that the hour of judgment had come. The seven bowls are going to be poured out. And, and many of them, as we read them next time, will be much like the plagues that were poured out of, out of Egypt. And so there's kind of an allusion here to the Exodus as countless people are coming to God. They're coming into the promised land in heaven. So we find redemption. We find deliverance here. There's hope in trust in Christ. It's a remarkable intervention by God himself. Because of that, they sang another song. They, they sang a song of God's almighty power, of his greatness, of his glory and his honor. And they praise him. It's a song of reverence and glory because they understand the position they're now in. They understand the position that God is in. God has brought them to this place. And isn't that something that we share with them as believers in Christ? God also saved us from death. From a time of spiritual isolation and darkness where torment never ends. Beloved, we too can sing of God's justice. We can sing of his truth and his holiness and his glory, of his awesomeness. We can sing all of these great things about God. And there's a lot of weight to this passage because we find refuge in Christ. What's the message of the gospel? Jesus said, I am the truth and the way and the life. Come to him, we find peace. We find rest from all the burdens that we have in life. This passage sets the stage for the following drama. It's going to unfold. Is it? It's going to show God's holiness. It's going to show God's wrath that's displayed upon a wicked and perverse generation. And that has to happen. God's holiness and his judgment has to come because if it doesn't, if God doesn't judge sin, then it lessens his glory. God wouldn't be glory if he didn't have judgment because God wouldn't be holy anymore because sin is in direct opposition to God. And so the scene depicted here in our passage is one of God in holiness and God in judgment. So read the remainder of chapter 15. John says, After I looked, the heavenly temple of the tabernacle of testimony was open. And out of the temple came seven angels with seven plagues dressed in pure bright linen with golden sashes wrapped around their chest. And one of the four living creatures gave the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God, who will live forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were complete. I want you to think about another passage in scripture. Isaiah chapter 6. It's there in Isaiah chapter 6 that we have this magnificent picture of a holy and righteous God. Isaiah says there, In the year of King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on the throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And in that passage, Isaiah talks about the seraphim, the, the mighty angels that were flying around everywhere, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And at the sound of their voices, as those angels sang that song, the threshold of the temple began to shake. And Isaiah realized that he was in the presence of an almighty God. And he said this, Woe is me, for I am undone, 
because I am a man of unclean lips. Now, this is Isaiah the priest. He said, I dwell in a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. See, beloved, Isaiah experienced the holiness of God to such a degree that he recognized, man, I am so far from God. Just like the Apostle Paul, if you read Paul's letters and you begin to study some of them, it's one of the things we're going to talk about this week. As Paul moves from his initial stage of being the apostle, just like John and Peter and Matthew, to one of reverence and glory underneath God, watching God do all these magnificent things in his life. At the end of his days, Paul says, I'm the chief of sinners. I'm, I'm such a wretch. And this is Paul who's grown in his faith all this time because he had experienced God's presence and God's holiness. He'd recognize the grace that God had poured upon him and allowing him to be such a magnificent part of God's plan. See, in our passage, as the Lord is preparing to manifest his holiness, John says that he sees the temple of heaven and the tabernacle being revealed. And again, we see a picture of the Exodus there. He saw the seven angels coming out of the temple and they have seven last plagues and they're clothed in pure white linen and they have golden sashes around their chest. And everything in this scene emphasizes God's holiness, God's purity, God's justice, God's there's a neat, tidy order to all of it as this procession begins to fill out. And, and, and God the Father is coming out as then the king is going to be ushered on the scene. These angels are presented with bowls of plagues. There's an impressiveness about all of this that's going on because it's the beginning of the end of wickedness. I said the king is coming. It's already been announced. Jesus is on his way. And soon we'll see next time the seven plagues will be unleashed upon a wicked population that's left upon the earth. There's those that have refused. No matter what, they're just going to be these diehard holdouts. And they're going to finally recognize the fury of a holy and righteous almighty God and all of his glory and all of his power. And so the bows are being given to the angels and smoke begins to fill the temple as the glory of God is opened up. Well, this is a powerful presence to recognize the awe-inspiring sight of an almighty God. And wouldn't we say, like Isaiah, woe is me. For I am a man of unclean lips. Beloved, if that's you today, if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, let me ask you to do so right now. You don't have to clean yourself up. You don't have to make yourself right. There's nothing you can do to make yourself right. The Bible says that yet while we were still sinners, while you're still in your sin, while you're doing all the bad things that you continue to do, Christ Jesus died for us. It's already the plan of God. God knew everything in your life from front to back, cover to cover, everything that you've ever did and everything you ever will do. So it amazes me sometimes that God knew everything that I did do and God knew everything that I will do and he still saved me. And he'll save you too. You just have to place your trust in him. You have to call upon the name of Jesus and say, Lord, I'm a sinner, but I trust you to save me. Lord Jesus, please come into my life. Cleanse me from all of my sin. Help me turn from my sin and follow you for the rest of my days. Beloved, if you'll pray that prayer, if you'll just ask God for that, if you'll ask him to reveal himself to you, I promise that he will. Sometimes he does it in just very simple ways as having someone come up and speak to you about it. But he comes to us and he cleanses us. And this is not based on emotions, on how you feel or how you do. Some days I don't feel like a pastor. I don't feel like a Christian some days. But God's word promises us that he saves us. Well, if you did that, if you've trusted in Jesus Christ, I'd like for you to either make a comment here on this video or, or give us a call here at the church and let us know that you have because we would like to pray for you. Uh, we'd like to get some materials to you, maybe a Bible if you don't have one, and uh, walk alongside of you and just uh, help you in your faith. 
Beloved, uh, I hope this message has been an encouragement to you. And uh, I pray for you this week. I pray that God is with you. I pray for uh, good things to come your way. And I pray for spiritual blessing. Till next time, God bless.